All right, so um, I, I am going to try to keep things uh, pretty much on schedule. Um, you know, we are, are spread across many time zones uh, here, and we have sort of a, a tight pack schedule uh, with not a whole lot of time for people to you know, go off and, and grab lunch or, or dinner. And so we want to make sure we keep to the time that we uh, have said we will. Uh, so I will give all the speakers uh, sort of a three minute warning. Uh, for most speakers, that'll be after 15 minutes, uh, and for the two invited talks, that will be uh, after, after 18 minutes. Um, so we are going to uh, start uh, today uh, with uh, Neil Brandt again uh, as the uh, chair of the uh, Science Collaboration, uh, giving a, a broad overview uh, talk. <laughs> All right, take it away, Neil. Okay, thank you. I'll try to share my screen here. Have it. Okay. Okay, is that is that good for everyone? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, good, great. Okay, so uh, today I would like to uh, report on the 2021 state of the LSST AGN science collaboration. Um, we're now just two to three years from Rubin Observatory operations, so things are getting very exciting. Of course, this also means we need to buckle down and really start getting ready in, in a hardcore way. And uh, so today I will only be hitting um, some of the, the recent highlights of, of our activities. My apologies if your favorite activity is, is not covered in depth. And my aim here is to give all attendees a common broad understanding of the goings on in the uh, science collaboration because there's a wide range of people's experiences in, in this respect. Uh, and, and this will allow them to have better appreciation of all the great talks that, that we have coming. And so the, the AGN Science Collaboration is interested in, well, essentially all aspects of active galaxies ranging from the black holes, to the accretion disk, to the, the, the corona, to the emission line region, to the obscuring materials, to, to jets, uh, to host galaxies and, and, and co-evolution with galaxies through the large scale structure connections into cosmic AGN demographics. And so we have, we have a lot of broad uh, interest, a lot of broad activities going on. And um, I'll be covering some of those um, although that will be mainly covered in all the, the, the coming talks. So the overall goals of, of the AGN Science Collaboration are to maximize the AGN Science return coming from LSST, to give feedback to the project, to ensure that that excellent AGN Science will indeed happen, and, and that that does take careful coordination with the project, and also to, of course, to be educating the broader community about LSST AGN science so they can get involved, for example, if, if they're interested or if they just want to learn about things more broadly. Um, the AGN science collaboration has existed uh, since the fall of 2006. Here is the, the first email. I think this is one of Michael Strauss's emails, the first meeting of the, the science collaborations. And we have generally become more organized over time, which of course is very important, especially now that operations are, are not so far away. And the AGN Science Collaboration has always been by design distinct from the project. Here is an organizational plan for the Science Collaborations back from, from 2005 prepared by, by Steve Kahn. And so we've always been distinct from the project and we thus have never received any kind of direct funding from the project. We always have been operating kind of on, on a shoestring and that of course has led to some, some challenges over the years, but I think we have managed to accomplish a lot, certainly given the the funding that we've had. We've certainly accomplished a great deal, I'd say. Um, the current membership of the science collaboration is, is such that we're up now to 107 members. We're actually showing rapid growth. We grew by 38 members over the past year. So we're almost at 40% growth rate. And we'll get very large indeed if, if that continues uh, up to operations and, and beyond. Um, we currently have 98 associate members and, and nine full members. Uh, the, the full members are responsible for doing quite a bit more heavy lifting. And if you're interested in trying to become a full member, we're happy to talk with people who want to put in the, the effort uh, to, to do so. Uh, the five largest national memberships are here. These make up the majority of the science collaboration, the US, UK, Chile, Serbia, and, and Italy. Um, membership applications are welcome, even from people who lack uh, data rights and application instructions are available at this web page. Um, as of 2019, we have an organized uh, science collaboration charter. And right now, the science collaborations are 
be becoming more formally recognized by, by the project and, and by the science advisory committee and, and the AGN science collaboration has applied uh, for formal recognition by the SAC under that new federation charter system. And I said a little bit more about that on, on the last telecon. I don't have time to cover that further here, but essentially it's just a, a formalization and, and a setting of minimum requirements uh, for the, the science collaborations. Um, the, the overall organization uh, of the science collaboration is, is shown here. This is from the AGN science collaboration charter. And um, we're supposed to have a pair of co-chairs. And here I have an important announcement for today. And, and that is effective uh, today. Gordon Richards, who has been doing a lot of heavy lifting for which we should all be very grateful, um, will actually be joining as the co-chair of the AGN Science Collaboration. So congratulations uh, to Gordon and, and thank you for all the, the effort that you've put in and, and there surely will be more uh, coming. So this will, this will be extremely helpful uh, as the um, AGN Science Collaboration management duties take on increasing amounts of effort uh, as the science collaboration continues to grow and so on. Um, we also have a number, a, a number of um, sort of panels we have a, a membership panel, which has been very active recently. We have a publications panel, an ethics panel, and, and various temporary kind of ad hoc panels, a road mapping panel, which is very important. And um, th th this is one level of organization uh, for the science collaboration. We also have a number of scientific subgroups on selection classification, on photometric and other redshifts, on variability science, on follow-up, and then on the the science platform support team. And, and this is the other level of organization grouped by cross-cutting by, by science. And, and of course is um, extremely important. And if people are interested in the, these various subgroups and somehow are not already signed up for them, uh, please contact us so we can get you in contact with the subgroup leaders so people can get involved where they're, they're most interested. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about some recent and ongoing um, activities of the, the science collaboration. First of all, we have uh, a lot of um, sort of communications ongoing. Um, we have regular um, science collaboration and subgroup telecons. Uh, we have in-person and remote meetings occasionally. Here are a couple of photos. This is the, the, the oh, I think the only in-person meeting we've actually managed to have. This one was held in Grapevine, Texas in 2017. A couple of nice photos here from, from that meeting. And, and then in um, 2020 June, we had a desire to have another in-person meeting. Um, it was gonna be in Madison, Wisconsin. It was a double AS meeting in a meeting, but unfortunately due to the pandemic, it wasn't possible to meet in person, but we did actually hold, hold, hold a quite successful, I think, virtual meeting that way. And in fact, the meeting we're having right now was kind of inspired by and, and being framed by the, the approach we took to that meeting. And all the recordings from the, the 2020 June meeting are available on YouTube and you're welcome to go uh, view them as, as interested. Um, we also, of course, have, have the email list. Uh, we're active in the LSST community and we have, have the Slack channel as well. So those are the, the, the methods by which you can remain informed about what's going on in, in the science uh, collaboration. Um, and I now wanna say a few words about the contributions to the, the survey strategy. Um, so we are, of course, broadly, the whole LSST enterprise is, is in the midst of this survey strategy optimization process. Uh, the goal here is to determine how to observe the main survey and then how to spend 10 to 20% of time on, on mini surveys. And, and of course, this is all essential for many AGN science cases, ranging from selection to variability to transients and, and other things. And um, back in April of this year, cadence notes were due. Many of you, I'm sure, know well about that. And the AGN science collaboration actually contributed substantially to those cadence notes in total across all the, the, the community. Um, 39 uh, cadence notes were, were submitted. In fact, eight of those were from the AGN Science Collaboration. Here are the abstracts for uh, six of those. And you can see they range from photometric redshifts to the deep drilling fields, to variability metrics, to blazars, uh, to additional um, variability uh, and structure function metrics uh, through to differential chromatic refraction and so on. And these are all available publicly uh, at this website. And this is one good way to get involved or, or, or at least informed about you know, what is going on uh, in terms of the, the cadence efforts of the EGN science collaboration is to read these cadence notes if you haven't had a chance to do that already. Um, so then 
overall, the, the game plan, according to a recent, uh, a recent draft I've seen by, by Federico Bianco and Jelko and others, is that by the end of 2021, the so-called Survey Cadence Optimization Committee, or SCOC, will select a broad cadence family capturing the overall strategy they plan to take with, with the cadence. And then over the next year, so by the end of 2022, they will be fine tuning those selected cadences to make a final recommendation as to what they propose the cadence should be for, for Rubin operations. And then of course, full science operations will begin and, and there will be continuous reevaluation and revision of the cadence as needed as we progress into and, and through operations. So that's the, the kind of overall game plan. And the um, AGN science collaboration must continue advocating on the cadence so we make sure that we, we can do our science well. And um, particularly, I think the AGN science collaboration members can, can make a valuable contribution by continuing to work through the new operation simulations as they're made publicly available and, and assessing if the new simulations uh, allow their desired cadence to be achieved using, of course, metrics. And if, if you, something you think is problematic about well, these, simula these simulations and they're going to destroy your science, it is kind of incumbent upon you to start speaking up because that's how you will be able to protect your, your science, hopefully. Um, we also um, must continue coordinating with the other science collaborations to see if we can push for mutually acceptable cadence solutions. Uh, I doubt we're going to get exactly what we want as the AGN folks, but you know, if we and other science collaborations communicate and, and work together, then hopefully we can get mutually agreeable solutions that, that, that allow everyone to do something really great, even if it isn't exactly what you might have wanted. And, and there, for example, we've had, um, just as one example, we've had very productive um, discussions with the Dark Energy Science Collaboration, and, and Dan Skolnick will be joining us on Wednesday uh, to continue those discussions, again, representing the Dark Energy Science Collaboration. So I think there are, there are real prospects there for you know, constructive um, engagement with other science collaborations. So I now wanna just talk about a few additional recent activities. Um, we of course have the, uh, the LSST AG and Science Collaboration Roadmap. A, a second version of the, the roadmap is in progress uh, pleasantly, pr presently, and the aim is to um, complete, according to, I asked Ohad about this, Ohad Shemmer's leading a, a lot of this work. The aim is to complete the uh, roadmap by the start of, of the fall semester, the, the second draft. And um, so please continue uh, contributing to the, this living document. And um, there of course are many activities ongoing to address the roadmap goals and to prepare for, for the LSST data. And that we'll be hearing about many of those in, in the coming talks uh, for, for the next three days. Um, so we also have this um, science collaboration data challenge um, led by Gordon and by Wei Zhang Yu. Uh, Wei Zhang will talk about this in more detail later today. This has been funded by the LSST Corporation and it's part of the general collaboration efforts to prepare students, postdocs and others to do LSST AG and science. So, so here you can uh, you know, engage in this data challenge. You can certainly get fame. You can even get a little bit of fortune. And um, this will um, be you know, a, a valuable learning experience to help everyone get ready for, for, for the data to come from Ruben. And, and of course, some AGN science collaboration members are also supporting other enabling science proposals that have broader AGN connections as well. Um, so some other key activities here, I'm just gonna list a, a number of other ones that are, that are important. So we continue to support the work of the Contributions Evaluation Committee which is assessing which international partners will earn data rights. Uh, we continue to advocate for AGNs uh, to the broader photometric redshift roadmap group and, to the, and in the broker workshops. Those are very important to make sure AGNs continue to be represented there. Um, the AGN Science Collaboration has several members on the Rubin Euclid Derived Data Products Working Group. And so we're making hope, sure, hopefully there, that, that reasonable choices will be made from an AGN perspective. Um, 15 AGN science collaboration members, I was pleased that, that there were so many, are uh, involved in data preview zero. And so I think it'll be very valuable if, if the data preview zero folks continue talking with the broader science collaboration at, at our coming telecons so that everybody is learning about this and seeing how data preview zero is going so we can all get ready at, at some level. And then also it's critically important that we continue to coordinate with 
other AGN projects. For example, there are these exciting reverberation mapping projects where Rubin photometric data can be extremely valuable to the ongoing spectroscopic reverberation mapping data as well. And so with a little bit of coordination there, hopefully that can lead to a lot of additional great science. Um, although that coordination is, is very important to, to achieve. Um, also, I'll say that we regularly give talks uh, worldwide highlighting uh, LSST AGN science here. Just a few recent meetings where the science collaboration has um, uh, you know, presented it, it, its overall uh, goals and activities. And, and we're also, we're always happy to represent the AGN science collaboration at institutes worldwide. So if you have uh, a need at your institute to have some AGN Rubin science presented there, contact us and we can try to help you um, as you deem uh, needed. Um, I will just end- Yeah, you've got three minutes. Got it. Yeah, I'm just wrapping up. So uh, I will end just by mentioning that, that another place where the AGN Science Collaboration has had a leading role is in um, gathering key data uh, for LSST plus multi-wavelength AGN studies. And we'll hear talks about this later on, so I won't go through all the details, but, but briefly, um, for example, uh, Mark Lacey and, and colleagues have led the getting high quality Spitzer coverage via the SERVS project and the deep drill uh, project of getting high quality uh, Spitzer coverage over essentially the entirety of, of three of the deep drilling fields. And this is a very impressive infrared survey in its own right. It, it's here as compared to, to other infrared surveys. And so this will be extremely valuable data to have in the can uh, once Rubin switches on. Uh, we also at Penn State ha have just recently um, completed getting, well, the best possible XMM Newton coverage we could achieve of the deep drilling fields. Uh, there, a recent paper by, by Chingling Ni has presented uh, exciting new results for the wide region around the Chandra Deep Field South and the Elias S1 re field. Here is panoramic X-ray imaging all around the Chandra Deep Field South, covering about half of what the, the deep drilling field uh, will be there. And in total, uh, among these three fields, we've detected about 10,200 AGNs. And this will serve as a ground truth AGN sample for calibration of LSST selection. And, and Chingling Ni will talk more about that. Uh, on Wednesday. Uh, also, I want to mention that we've been working hard to gather other photometric data or analyze other publicly available uh, photometric data in, in uniform ways. And we have, for example, recently, this is led by, by Fan Zhao, a, a Penn State student, delivered 1.6 million photometric redshifts uh, using matched uh, tractor photometry spanning from 0.36 to 4.5 microns. So we've gotten quite good photometric redshift data publicly available now. Um, for, for two of the deep drilling fields. And we'll continue pushing on these things as well. So with that, I, I will wrap up and uh, thank everyone for, for their attention. I hope this has been valuable in terms of getting everyone to a common broad understanding of, of the activities of the science collaboration. And one thing that I hope we can discuss perhaps later this week is whether the AGN science collaboration should continue to have annual summer meetings like this one. We can see how this one goes, but that's something I hope we can talk about near the end. So thank you very much. Great, thanks, Neil. Uh, we have uh, plenty of uh, time for, for questions and, and conversations about, you know, just uh, the structure of the AGN Science Collaboration that people want to understand uh, more about. So feel free to, to shout them out or, or put them in the chat um, as you see fit. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to take questions verbally or however people would like, that's great. I see there's something in the chat, but I, I haven't been able to read. Are those questions or is that something else? No, that's something else. Oh, okay, fine. I, I wonder if I am not a question, but a, a, a comment of something that Please. we may be uh, thinking about, if I may. Go ahead. Um, which is, um, there's been quite a bit of discussion at the project level about early science and and how mm -hmm. and how um, how the the end of commissioning and the start of operations can be mm -hmm. can be configured in a way to make to make uh, the science early science return uh, as, as influential and impactful as possible. I don't know if that that may be a theme that we'll find ourselves coming back to. I'll just bring it up as something for us all to think about. Um, yeah, yeah, th there is. Yeah, I, I didn't have time to mention that. Uh, I did mention it on a telecom the other day. I saw that there has been this announcement. I think I have it here, in fact, on a piece of paper. Yeah, for the for the commissioning team 
Right. Right. Uh, and, that's, and so, that's actually some. It's that's distantly related. I can. Explain yeah, that, that's one. That's one way. Way. that's one way. That's what I mean. I don't know if anyone from the EGN Science Collaboration will be on board for joining that because that looks like a substantial amount of work. But yep. you certainly could learn a lot about the hardcore activities involved with commissioning a, a major uh, worldwide observatory that way. So that's mm -hmm. one prospect. Um, and, and then, of course, data preview zero. I think is another. Thing we, we can do, uh, take that very seriously. Um, if you have any other constructive suggestions, Michael, uh, please. Well, let me just mention that the, I mean, the quest that, so data preview zero is, is currently with simulated data. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, data previews um, one and two will be, will be getting closer to, 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 to real um, um, Ruben data. There, there, the question of this early science is uh, what kind of commissioning activities can, and uh, say the first six months of operations, how, how might those be configured to allow science to be written, important science papers to be written in that first year, knowing yep. that lots of things, you know, this will not be the full um, uh, Rubin uh, uh, data output. And you won't have 20,000 square degrees in, in six filters to the full depth. And yep. you won't have templates to look for variables and, and so on and so forth. Um, yep. Yeah, well, cl clearly, I'm sure that, that, that that's a broad, uh, multifaceted uh, question. Yeah. I mean, certainly one thing I'm very keen on, as you might imagine, is pushing, you know, at least one of the deep drilling fields down to the, well, down to a pretty good depth. I don't know if you mm -hmm. can achieve the full the full 10-year uh, typical depth on a random patch of sky, but to a pretty darn good depth, I think pushing one of the deep drilling fields pretty hard could be very valuable. And the sooner it can be chosen which one it will be, uh, the sooner um, people can really start focusing their efforts on that one. Uh, yeah, the, I, my, my understanding is that it's always been a commissioning activity to do exactly that. Uh, but, the but it all comes down to the timing of exactly when, one, one, uh, when the telescope is in good enough shape that when and the whole system is in good enough shape that one can actually start uh, doing those observations. So yeah. it will be a, a question of time of year yeah. uh, to select um, which field you might use. Yep, yep. So we're, we're trying to ramp up to get ready for all of them as best we can, yeah. Right. Um, I, I have a question about uh, the cadence. Uh, okay. Now that all those white papers have been written, uh, yes. do you know whether uh, the, 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 the observatory will get back to the science collaborations um, as they make decisions, as they kind of look into more detailed fine tuning of that? Yeah, or? yeah. so certainly, certainly that it would be very bad. I think, I think everyone agrees it would be very bad if the stock just somehow went back in a smoky room and then came out and said, here's the answer. Um, I, I, think, I think certainly that this is, this is, is planned to be a highly interactive um, activity with the uh, science collaborations. And so um, that I, certainly, I certainly hope we'll be hearing a lot from them and that, that's what I would expect. And uh, we, do, we are fortunate to have um, a member of the AGN Science Collaboration, Franz Bauer, who's on the SCOC. And, and so hopefully he can serve as you know, one liaison um, to, who can keep us informed on what's ongoing there. Okay. Is, is that addressing? Yeah. So, is that addressing your question, Paulina? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, sh surely, surely, this is supposed to be an interactive process. I believe it was announced as such from its very inception. So, I think that's the way it will be. We have time for maybe one more question, Franz. You posted something in the chat. Is that something that you want to have as a side conversation, or or to to talk about here? It, it was just a quick question. Nothing less. Go ahead, Franz. I, I, I can't read the chat because my screen is all taken over by the PowerPoint, but, but go ahead. It was just a question to Michael. Oh, okay. Well, that about Michael, the, depth, the depth of the DDF, I, I, the depth of the commissioning data, I think it's to the wide, fast, deep depth, not DDF depth. Oh, absolutely. Oh, you, you, yeah, that, that's certainly what I meant. Yeah, that's certainly what I meant. I, I think I, there's no way I think you could do the DDF depth, but I think yeah, wide, typical wide, fast, deep step, or something around there to the extent it can be achieved could be helpful, yes. And Neil, by the way, you can open the, the, the chat window, even though yeah, you have it. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay, well, I'll do my best. I'm not, I'm not a Zoom black belt, but I do <laughs> right. my best, yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. So uh, 
Um, one thing I'll bring up before we move on, right, is, you know, Neil mentioned uh, these, these various um, committees, um, some of which exist and some of which don't. And so there's, there's sort of this weird catch-22 since we, you know, restructured the science collaboration a few years ago such that, um, you know, we are, the, these, these, these uh, the, the, the publications panel and ethics and memberships are, are, are structured in a way that you need to be a full member to be part of them. But, um, you know, the question to people is, are we, um, sort of doing enough things uh, to enable people to be full members without sort of um, being on, say, the publications committee. Um, so certainly at the end of this meeting, we'd be very interested in sort of hearing, you know, how else um, can we, uh, you know, help uh, get you and your students uh, and, and whoever uh, involved in more detail. Yeah, yeah, we, we very much, uh, we, we, we would like to have more full members. Um, uh, you, you, you know, you do have to do, you do have to understand you're going to be getting into where you're going to have to do some real heavy lifting and some real work, but we're hoping many people will be up for that um, and, and can contribute uh, to pushing things forward further. So let, let us know if you have strong interest there uh, and if you have any constructive suggestions as to how you'd like to, you know, to get there. Okay, uh, we should probably move yeah. on and yep. turn things yep. over to, to Amanda. Uh, so okay. the, the next speaker is uh, Amanda Banerjee, um, uh, until recently of, of Cambridge, and now uh, I believe uh, formerly uh, from Southampton. Um, she is going to be giving an invited uh, talk uh, as a liaison to the Galaxies uh, Science Collaboration, although she is also a member of the AGN Science Collaboration. Uh, and the title of that uh, talk, I've got to go uh, find my list, uh, AGN host galaxies in the, the Rubin era. Um, as this is an invited talk, uh, it's going to be a little bit longer. Uh, Amanda, I'll give you a um, heads up at, at about 19 minutes. Great. Thanks, Gordon. And um, just to check, you can hear me and see my screen. I can hear you. Uh, I cannot see your screen. Yeah, we're, uh, we're not seeing the screen share, but we hear you. Ah, okay. Um, let me try again. Um, Can you see it now? Yes. And it's in full screen? Yes. Great, thanks. Um, so th thanks very much um, for the invitation. So as Gordon said, um, I'm here in my role as one of the co-chairs of the Galaxy Science Collaboration. So I co-chair that collaboration with Sagata Kaviraj. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about AGN host galaxies and some of the things that we have been thinking about within the galaxy science collaboration from the point of view of um, thinking about the, the properties of the supermassive black holes that live in, in the LSST galaxy population. So, um, so of course, uh, as, as all of you are aware, LSST will open up brand new discovery space for the study of AGN and their host galaxies, and it will really do that over all of cosmic time. And um, the reason we want to study uh, the AGN population in context with the galaxy population is of course, because we know that galaxies and their black holes co-evolve. Um, this is the, the famous plot showing you the cosmic formation history of the universe in red and the black hole accretion history of the universe in black, showing you that black holes and galaxies are growing in step all the way to cosmic noon, redshifts of two or so where most of the galaxies and black holes formed. And then both of those quantities decline going into the very early universe. So um, in terms of what LSST will bring, well, um, in, the, in the lower redshift universe, the, the low surface brightness sensitivity of LSST will really be completely new, um, new uh, exploration territory. So that will allow us to do lots of studies of the kinds of uh, galaxies that, that low redshift AGN live in, pick out tidal tails, uh, other low surface brightness features that might uh, give us indications about past merging activity. So we will learn a lot about AGN host galaxies uh, from that. Of course, the, the depth of LSST data will, will also be unprecedented. I think this will be particularly true in the deep drilling fields, which will be uh, the ideal places to really push these, these studies of co-evolution to the very high redshift population and to the most massive galaxies and black holes in the high redshift universe. And then of course the opening up of the time domain where we will find new populations of AGN that uh, we haven't been found, that haven't been found through traditional color selection methods. And again, we will want to understand what kind of galaxies they live in. Um, 
But really, one of the things that I want to emphasize is as we look uh, from the current era of wide surveys like the SDSS to the LSST era, um, AGN activity is something we will want to think about as a continuum uh, property of a, of a galaxy. So we will want to move away from discrete classifications of things as galaxies or quasars to really thinking about the accretion activity of the, the LSSD galaxy population and a continuum of accretion activity. And some of the things that we might want to think about inferring about the black hole and about the host galaxy, I've just listed a few here um, to, to try and connect the supermassive black holes and their host galaxies. We want to understand the black hole mass and the luminosity, which are the most fundamental quantities that then give you a, a handle on the accretion rate. Uh, if you care about how AGN feedback affects galaxies, you might want to understand something about the prevalence, presence of outflows, um, about obscuration of the AGN. And then in terms of the host galaxy properties, uh, the stellar mass, the star formation rate, the size of the galaxy, maybe the morphology, and again, the levels of obscuration. So we will be trying to infer a lot of different um, quantities about the, the supermassive black hole and the host galaxy. And of course, one of the things that we won't have is a redshift. So we will, we will want to infer that as well. And all of this from photometric data. So this is going to be incredibly challenging. Some of these, these things, uh, I would say we probably cannot infer from photometry alone. So the main message of my talk really is that um, if we're going to maximize the, the uh, AGN galaxy science that's going to be possible with LSST, uh, we really want to be thinking about synergies about how LSST fit, fits into the wider landscape of survey data, multi-wavelength survey data, and also spectroscopic data that will be around um, over the next decade or so. So a um, few of the things that I want to talk to you about today is how we think about extending the wavelength coverage of LSST into the near infrared for a better sampling of the spectral energy distributions. Initially, that will be using current data sets like Vista, WISE, and Spitzer, but eventually we want to think about synergies with the Euclid and Roman space telescopes, uh, and then also take advantage of surveys at other wavelengths, as Neil has already alluded to in his introductory talk, um, X-ray and radio surveys, where the contamination from uh, stars and inactive galaxies uh, are less than in the optical wavelengths, and you can use those surveys to pr provide these ground truth uh, tables for finding active galaxies. And finally, something I won't have time to go into today, but really thinking about the synergies with wide field spectroscopic surveys as well that will overlap LSSD. So let me start with the uh, first one, extending the wavelength coverage of LSSD into the near infrared. Um, so this is work that is uh, being led by Raphael Shirley, who's a postdoc at the University of Southampton. And this is uh, one of the, the UK's accepted in-kind contributions um, to, the, to the LSSD project. Um, and what Raphael has been doing is uh, building a pipeline where we are proposing to conduct point pixel level analysis of the LSSD data and of infrared data coming from the VeraCam camera on the, on the VISTA telescope. So that extends the, the LSSD uh, wavelength coverage uh, into the infrared J, H and K bands. Um, so currently we're using the hyper -Prime cam data as a proxy for LSSD, but the intention is that uh, the, the pipeline is written in such a way that when LSSD is on sky, it should be really easy to just um, put that data through the pipeline. So, so the pipeline builds on uh, a lot of the, the work that has gone uh, into the VISTA science pipeline already to, to, to produce processed images from the raw images. And then we take those processed images and we put them through the, the LSSD stack. Uh, and what that allows us to do is um, put essentially all of this image onto the, um, currently hypersub prime cam, eventually LSSD sky map. So the sky map, uh, which many of you will be familiar with, is, is uh, defined by these tracts and patches. So you can see the, uh, an example here, the bigger squares here are the tracts and the smaller squares are the patches. And we take all of the VISTA imaging and we do this one-to-one -one pixel matching onto the native um, HSC or eventually Rubin pixel scale. Uh, and then that allows us to do source detection and measurement simultaneously on the optical and infrared imaging. Um, and the advantage of doing that is that uh, we're able to, to go to lower signal to noise in the infrared data than would be possible if you were just to do a simple catalog level matching. You're also running the images through the same pipeline, so you're producing consistent photometry across the entire optical to, to infrared wavelength range. And when it comes to, to dropouts, so things that are detected in the optical but not in the infrared or vice versa, you're getting important information about upper limits um, in the bands that, that these sources are not detected. So um, 
Currently, what Raphael has done with our test field that we've run this pipeline on already uh, is the is one of the LSSTD drilling fields, the XMM field, which Neil already mentioned. Uh, you can see the HSC patches in red here, and then the Vista pointings uh, are in blue. Um, so we've produced a 10-band catalog using this, this pipeline already in this field uh, that's uh, covering an area of about four and a half square degrees to a K-band depth of 23 and a half. Um, and that is being provided as a test data set for the AGN SC data challenge, which you'll hear about later today. Um, we are also, uh, oh, before I, I, I get to that, just to show you some um, quality control plots, just to show that the pipeline is doing what we expect it to do. Um, so in this plot, we're comparing the HSC R band magnitude produced from our pipeline with the public um, uh, HSC data release to R band magnitudes. And you can see here excellent agreement between the two. It's not, not surprising because the LSSD pipeline is basically the same as, as the HSC um, uh, pipeline. And then in the next uh, plot here, you can see the, the comparison of the K band magnitudes from our pipeline now um, versus the, the K band magnitudes produced using a different uh, source extraction and photometry code S extractor. Um, and you can see that the agreement, the median offset is still very small. There's a bit more scatter than in the case of the R band. And this is almost certainly because of the different um, pipelines that are being used. Um, so, so this is showing you that the pipeline is uh, doing roughly what we, we wanted to do. And uh, we are currently in the process of generating uh, joint HSC and VISTA catalogs, processing all of the VISTA data that overlaps with the current HSC public data release too. So these are just showing you the red is the HSC coverage and the blue is the VISTA coverage and the various uh, different HSC fields. Um, the total area over all of these fields is about 800 square degrees that we do plan to process over the next few months or so to produce um, uh, joint optical and infrared catalogs. And the, the wider area catalogs will, will go slightly shallower uh, than the DDFs, so K-band depths of about 20th to 21st magnitude. Um, so if you're interested in looking at these catalogs, if, if the extension to the infrared is, is um, of interest to you for your science, we're very happy to share these catalogs with anyone that might be interested. So please do get in touch with myself or Raphael if you want to find out more. So let me move on now to the, the next thing that I want to talk about today, which is taking advantage of surveys at other wavelengths uh, to, to try and understand something about the LSSD AGN population. So um, as Neil has already mentioned, um, in the, the deep drilling fields, we have these fantastic um, X-ray data sets that are covering really very large areas now. Um, and you will hear more about these, I believe, on, on Wednesday. But again, we have been taking one of these uh, X-ray data sets from Chen et al. 2018, the XMM serves catalog, and trying to understand what we can infer about um, AGN and their host galaxies uh, for these, for these X-ray AGN using LSSD-like data. So this is work led by my current PhD student, Adam Marshall at Cambridge. Um, and what Adam has been doing is analyzing a um, spectroscopic subset of the, the Chen et al. XMM X-ray AGN catalog. Uh, we've deliberately restricted our sample to um, high-ish redshifts, so redshifts about 0.7. And um, we're using multi-wavelength photometry for these AGN um, from HSC, from the VISTA video um, survey and from SPITSA serves, and fitting um, composite ga uh, galaxy and AGN spectral energy distribution models to this photometry to see what we can infer about AGN and the host galaxies. Um, so the galaxy templates that uh, we're, we're using to fit this population come from the fast stellar population synthesis code. Um, you can see here a, a couple of extreme examples of the galaxy SEDs. The orange is a, an old galaxy, uh, and then the blue is a, a much younger, more highly star forming galaxy with uh, strong emission lines. And uh, the free parameters are things like the age, the stellar mass, the star formation, e-folding time, and the dust extinction of the galaxy. Um, the new, new bit of our analysis compared to, to what's been done before is the incorporation of this new Quasar template that you hear much more about from Matthew Temple's talk later today. Um, so this new Quasar template, which um, Matthew has just submitted the paper and uh, I believe is now um, available to the AGN Science Collaboration, um, it incorporates a much better understanding of the intrinsic Quasar emission at rest frame optical wavelengths. So a lot of the, the previous templates, because they were based on lower redshift AGN, had um, a significant contribution from the AGN host galaxy in the rest frame optical. Um, the other really new thing that Matthew has done in this template is incorporated an up to 
today's understanding of the evolution of the emission line properties uh, of AGN as a function of luminosity. And you can see on, in the right-hand panel here, just the, the diversity of emission lines that, we, that is incorporated into the model, uh, very strong PP emission lines in orange to much weaker, strongly blue shifted emission lines in blue. Uh, and uh, I don't have time to, to go into this in detail, but it turns out that the, the, the strength of these emission lines matter when you're talking about um, the current era of precision photometry data sets. These, have, the, these emission lines have a material impact on, on the colors uh, of the AGN. And of course, the other thing is that these, uh, these, uh, this new Quasar template is also higher resolution compared to uh, the previous uh, templates like the Richards 2006 template. And again, that matters in, in the current era of precision photometry data sets. So incorporating the, the, the galaxy and the quasar uh, SED models, we're able to get uh, good fits to the, the multi-wavelength uh, for these X-ray AGN. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples now, um, really making the point that you need this multi-wavelength data to be able to simultaneously probe the AGN and the host galaxy. So here you can see um, an SED going um, from the rest frame ultraviolet wavelengths all the way through to the rest frame infrared. Um, and really it's the, the addition of the VISTA and Spitzer data that allows you to do this. And um, the, the data is shown in red and that's being fit by an unobscured quasar template shown in blue. And then the, the host galaxy dominates when you get to the kind of one micron region. And that's actually confirmed by what we see in the HSC color composite image. So you see a blue point source. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, if it's clear on your screens, but this, it's surrounded by some fuzzy red emission, which almost certainly is, is coming from the, from, from the host galaxy. Here's a, a different example. Here now is a, an X-ray AGN, which is being well fit by a, a model that is completely dominated by the host galaxy across this entire wavelength range. So this is a, a very obscured AGN um, that's confirmed by the X-ray properties of this source and by the, the very red image that we see here in the HSC imaging. And I think one of the, the really exciting things to come out of what Adam's been doing is uh, we've been finding that we are uh, using Matthew Temple's um, SCD model. Actually properties of the AGN just from photometric data. Um, so what I'm doing here is a, a zoom in um, of uh, another X-ray this is a picture of two points out from the model from, from Matthew Temple. And when you look at the SDSS spectrum of the source, um, you find that actually the, there's, a, there's a really, really between the um, inline strength line properties from photometric data with the combination of LSSD like data and, and these new quasar SED models. Um, but I, I want to kind of end this part of my talk um, on a bit of a cautionary note. Um, so while uh, we are getting good fits to the data, we can do this kind of um, fitting of AGN plus host galaxy components to this multi-wavelength photometry, it is still incredibly challenging to, to get all of these parameters um, just from broadband photometry. So here's another example. This is another X-ray uh, AGN from the XMM Surfs catalog. The red points here are real data. And what I'm showing are two fits on the left and right. Both of these are but you can see that they are completely in terms of what you would infer the uh, galaxy. So on the side, um, we've got uh, these two galaxies, usually the galaxy, which is a star-forming host galaxy, with an obscured AGN. Um, now contributing to the, the infrared emission. And, and based on the photometry alone, you, you cannot tell the difference between these two. So it is very, very challenging to, to infer all of these uh, properties just from photometric data. And just to make this point, 
is the When you look at one-dimensional distribution, so look at the, the stellar mass, for instance, then what we find is that um, um, we've got uh, asymmetric tails, we've got, um, oops, oh, sorry, we've got Man asymmetric. Amanda, you're lagging a little bit, but at least for me, not for everybody, but um, you've got about uh, four minutes left. Um, uh, I'm just sort of stalling okay. a little bit too to see if we can catch up for a second. But um, but but go ahead. Can you hear me? I hear you lagging very badly uh, right now. I try stopping my video to see if it makes a difference. I'm doing that. Sure. Okay. Okay. Let's see how that does. <clears throat> right. Can Can everybody hear me? Yeah, I can now hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, I've stopped my video, so hopefully that should help. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, the point that I want to make here is that it is complicated to try to interpret um, the, 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 the posterior distributions if you just think of um, getting a best fit stellar mass or a best fit age or a best fit luminosity for your AGN um, from these, these distributions, which are, which are non-Gaussian. So what we propose doing is actually not to try to represent all of this complexity with a single number, but rather to consider all of the, the MCMC samples from every object and their distribution in posterior space. And when you do that, um, it turns out that, that your ensemble properties are actually uh, reliable. So here, what I'm showing you are the X-ray luminosities of the, the X-ray AGNs. So those come independently from the XMM data and then the optical luminosities from our SED fits. And then the contours are just meant to show you the density of points in this full posterior space. And that, th that actually gives you uh, an X-ray luminosity to optical luminosity relation that agrees very well with uh, what you expect from, from the literature. Um, and then in, in, in terms of the background color coding of the points, so each hex bin here, in, again, in this full posterior space is color coded by the median stellar mass. So, um, when, when you do that, um, what you, you find, it's, it's a weak correlation, but nevertheless, what you find is that the most luminous AGN tend to live in the most massive galaxies. So, for all of these AGN across this entire wavelength range. Um, but what we can do with, with uh, Euclid and Roman is we can actually try to do this in, in pixel space. So here I'm showing you just one example. This is one of my favorite um, AGN. This is a dusty, very high luminosity quasar that we discovered back in 2015 with um, infrared imaging data. Um, in the SDSS image, you see nothing because this is a, a very obscured quasar. But now when you go to hyper-supreme cam, same wavelength as the SDSS data, you pick up all of this blue emission, this extended emission. Um, this emission we don't think is coming from the quasar. The quasar is very obscured, but we think this, this emission is actually coming from the star-forming regions in the, in the quasar host galaxy. And when you go to ALMA imaging of this particular quasar, in fact, you pick up two distinct galaxies. Uh, this, is, this is a quasar that's sitting in a major merger. Um, and the, the HSC star forming regions are actually extended in the same direction as the, the ALMA, the molecular gas in ALMA. So I think in the next talk, you'll hear much more about um, what you can do with uh, um, about AGN host galaxies from hypersuprime cam. Um, I really just want to make the point that when we have the combination of Rubin and Euclid and Roman, we will be able to do these kinds of studies uh, for much larger samples actually separate the AGN and galaxy emission in pixel space. 
Um, and as, as Neil alluded to, if you're interested in these kinds of synergies, please do contribute to the discussions happening at the moment on the, the, the Reuben Euclid Derived Data Products Forum. So um, I'm one of the, the members of the working group on that, um, of that working group, and we're preparing a white paper over the summer to think about these kinds of synergies uh, between Rubin and Euclid data. So I think I'm, I'm pretty much out of time. I hope people got most of that. I don't know if I cut out for, for some of it, but I'll just leave my summary up. So um, just to emphasize that in the Rubin era, we will have to think of AGN activity as a, a, a continuum a property of the LSST galaxy population. Um, and really we should be thinking about the synergies between LSST and other multi-wavelength surveys and also spectroscopic surveys, if we're going to maximize um, the, what, what we can learn about co-evolution of AGN and their host galaxies from this fantastic data. So I'll finish there and, and take any questions. Great, thanks, Amanda. Um, so definitely a, a few minutes for, for questions, um, especially if, if uh, people have questions ab about um, slides that that were were lagged uh, back there. Um, yeah, Maurizio, go ahead. Um, Amanda, thanks for the nice talk. I was wondering, given how well you showed that there is a need for synergies in different wavelengths, is the current uh, Rubin policy, you think, uh, um, good for addressing this problem, or should we think about pushing from some relaxation? I've seen the attempt with uh, the synergies with Euclid, and I'm not always sure that the current rules allow a very uh, helpful exchange of data or synergies. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can sort of speak to that um, in in my in my uh, from a from a galaxy science collaboration point of view. Um, might be, might be. I might leave it to, to Neil or Gordon to speak speak about it from from an AGN science collaboration point of view. Uh, but certainly in the Galaxy Science Collaboration, we we are pushing for you know thinking about LSST within this this landscape of multi wavelength imaging and spectroscopic surveys. Um, certainly, when we have discussed in kind contributions within the Galaxy Science Collaboration, we have um, recognized the the value of um, in-kind contributions that bring in, you know, um, some of these, these other data sets that, that are valuable to, to maximize the, the galaxy science. I don't know if there are specific policies that you um, Certainly from a galaxy science collaboration point of view, I think it's something that um, we are quite keen on and we are quite clear uh, will be necessary because, because uh, there, there's going to be limited amount that you can learn about the galaxy population just with the LSST data alone. Uh, Mara Salvato. Yeah, I was uh, typing in because I was not sure that uh, my internet will support the entire audio. So the first was a comment when you were speaking about the degeneracy on the fitting, that is exactly the same problem that we have when you compute the photosis. This is just the degeneracy and you have more parameters than the number of bands. So. It is a, a well-known problem, but the question for me is when you try to make your MCMC, uh, whether you are taking into account the uncertainty also in the photometric redshift, or you're assuming to have spec Z for that experiment, because then yeah. the marginalization become even more gigantic. Yes, yes, uh, no. So, so everything I've shown you is for high confidence spectroscopic redshifts. So, so exactly. you know, yes. So, so it's even worse. With the photo, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's going to be more dram dramatically worse. And then exactly. I have a question yes. on the beginning. Sorry, there was another question at the beginning that I really had in, uh, internet jumping, so I could not hear. When you make the comparison in the photometry with the IP Supreme Cam, and mm -hmm. you were showing the good, the good agreement, I wanted to ask which of the photometry you were using because they have a model, Cron, and other type. And depending on the type of the objects extended or point like a different photometry uh, works better. So I was wondering what you have used or what will be provided uh, in the future when the, the real SST data will come in. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good question. So the comparisons that I was showing were for aperture photometry. So they were, you know, fixed apertures with an aperture, I, I believe Perfect. with an aperture correction. But one of, one of the things that we're testing at the moment, because running the model fitting for, for every single object is, is much more time consuming. Um, so, and that there's debates about, certainly from a galaxy's point of view, there's, there's debates about whether it is the right thing to do to take, you know, 
to, to do you fit a separate model in the optical and infrared or do you take the model that you fit in the optical and then force that on the infrared photometry and just allow the normalization to vary so i think there's choices to be made when it comes to the model fitting about really what is the right thing to do when you produce these these multi-wavelength catalogs and that's something we're keen to get feedback from as many different science areas as possible to see you know what there is um a, a desire to have um, because that the model fitting is more computationally expensive. Yeah. So we, we really want to, you know, make make a considered choice about how we do that. So everything I was showing was aperture photometry. Thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, Patricia Nordam. Hi, thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a comment. I don't know if you if you said it because I couldn't hear well. But uh, regarding the um, the problem where you can have uh, either a decomposition of a strong AGN and an old stellar population or a obscured AGN and a young stellar population, that you could distinguish between these two scenarios with the optical variability. So if you have two epochs in the bluest point, it would be unlikely for the AGN or the quasar to show no variability uh, between the epochs, for example. Yes, absolutely. So I think this is something we haven't, you know, be, well, because we don't have that data, we haven't looked into it at all, but absolutely will we'll, we'll be critical um, and, and indeed something that LSSD can do. I agree. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, and one last question from Guan. Uh, hi, a very nice talk. Uh, thank you. And uh, I just want to make a comment that uh, since you have a talk about using the multi wavelength data, including X ray radio optical, to identify AGNs. I just want to recommend that we have a code called XGale, which can fit simultaneously the SED using uh, from X-ray to radio, the, all the wavelengths, including both the galaxy and the uh, AGN component. Yeah, I just uh, have a <laughs> other attachment. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, any last comments or questions before we move on? I think we're we're on schedule to, to move on, so. Okay, uh, thanks, Amanda, I appreciate that. Um, if you would be willing to um, to post slides uh, in case people missed anything, that would be, that would be great. Um, and uh, John Silverman from IPMU uh, is uh, up next, uh, where he is going to be talking about quasar host galaxies uh, with HSC uh, as a precursor to uh, LSSD. John, take it away. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, so this is to build off of what you know what Mando was talking about, um, but focusing at lower redshifts at redshift less than one. Um, sorry, it's a little late here in Japan, so I'll do the best I can. Um, so last year, Michael presented a lot of the HSC science that has been done that is relevant for LSST. So this is going to be a more focused and a little bit technical. I, I think it's good, but, so, but we'll see how that goes. And so the issue is really about how well can you disentangle the AGN from the host galaxy emission to, you know, to study the host galaxy and also the AGN free of host galaxy contamination. So most of the work that I am showing is by graduate student, Jun Yao Li and two postdocs, Xu Heng Ding and Lali Twadi Kawana Kachek. And Michael and Andy have contributed greatly to this work as well. Okay, so let's just look at, you know, for, you know, we went to HST for 25 years now for the study of host galaxies, and it's been superb. And we're now waiting for, for JWST. And so, you know, where do the ground based optical and large surveys fit in? And really, it's number statistics where we can still have the resolution to be able to see features like we see here. So I'm just going to jump in and show you what, you know, what, when I first started to look at the HSC images of SDSS quasars, I was amazed at the structures that you could see. If you just scan this briefly, you just, it doesn't look as sharp as the HST images. However, th these quasars are all at redshift less than one, maybe a, around redshift 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Um, I hope you can see my cursor. But all of these have the host galaxy detected. And what you can see is you can see evidence for spiral arms. In a lot of these cases, you can see bars. And so there's a lot of substructure beyond the host. And so I think it just really shows what, what's to come with LSST with even greater numbers 
Um, and I, that could be another, another conversation, but I do think we need LSST and HSC is not going to give us all the science that we need to on studying the host galaxies of AGM. So we heard from Amanda on the science. So let me just say, um, you know, the, the, the uniqueness is combining depth, area, and resolution. We all know that. But really pushing on those three together is where the, the new science, I think, is coming. And so we'll learn about the host galaxies, you know, the individual structural components, such as the bulge, the disk, a bar, or nearby neighbors, or any tidal features. And, um, you know, the motivation for this study was to try to measure the galaxy mass because we had black hole masses for the type ones. And so I will show you that at the end. And so all of this could give us some clue of how supermassive black holes are fed, looking on, you know, a few kiloparsec scales. And I think this is relevant for environmental studies. You need to control for your, the host galaxy of the quasars. Okay, so just a little bit more on my interest in Rubens and I think all of us is it's the unrivaled statistics where you probe a wide dynamic range in AGN property, galaxy property, and then their, their environment or their dark matter halo. So populating that space with large samples is only um, what, can, what can be accomplished with LSST. And I wanna say for the students that I think it's, um, it's a great discovery space to, to work with the images and not just the catalogs. And so it's good to now to learn the tools to be able to work with these images um, with such a large uh, data volume. Okay, so a little bit on uh, HSC. So I know Neil said that we should keep this focus on LSST. So wherever I say HSC, just replace it with LSST. It's remarkably similar, same pixel scale, wide area survey, it's similar depths. And so I will mostly be discussing the, the wide area survey where you can see the depth in G through Y here compared to LSST. So LSST will go deeper and I am interested to see how the results that I'll show will change with that deeper imaging. But they are, HSC is already reaching pretty close. So I think it, it's going to be, it's very informative of what's to come with LSST. And in particular, the resolution is key. So with HSC, um, the I band is always taken in the best seeing condition. So we have a median seeing of 0.6 arc seconds. And so that's why you saw in those images of quasars that you can start to see the structures that you do. And the thousand square degrees is really key for having a large sample of, of quasars or AGN uh, at, at the brightest luminosities. Okay. And so what I'm going to show is still based on public data, it's 300 square degrees with five bands, but I wanted to update you with the current survey coverage. So as of June of this year, um, and you can look at this middle column here, this is the area that's covered in the five filters. So five colors now reaching 700, close to 780 square degrees. Okay, so we're getting there. Okay, so if you do a match of 500,000 quasars, let's say, in the DR14 with HSC, you come up with over 50,000. But if you look at less than redshift one, and I'll show you why we do that, it's to detect the host, you get about 5,000. So it's a remarkable sample, 5,000 quasars, where we can study the host galaxy, the properties of the, <clears throat> the quasars and their host galaxies. What also is... Um, unique to these large surveys is the comparison samples that we're going to have. We will, in HSC, we we're looking at 100 square degrees now of 1.5 million galaxies. So you can see the sheer number statistics are just remarkable. Each cell here is color coded to show you the number of galaxies. So we have over 10,000 galaxies per some of these cells. And so all of the properties of the AGN host that we measure, we can compare to the inactive population with large number statistics. Okay. Now, one of the other issues is that um, we have always needed a tool that can decompose quasars and their hosts and run on large samples with minimal intervention. And so we have been using a, a tool called Lenstronomy, written by Simon Beer and Adam Amara, where we turned off 
the lensing, and we now have adapted this to run on AGM samples and galaxies, and, and that'll be coming out very soon as a, on the archive, it's called Galite. And the features that we, for why we wanted to use this is it, it's, a, it's a forward model prescription. It has a particle swarm optimizer. So it does really well at trying to find um, the optimal um, fit without getting stuck in local minimum. And it has full MCMC error analysis. And so you get um, covariances on, on various parameters that you put into your model. We haven't explored this much, but you can put in a error on your PSF. You feed it the PSF, but also the error. And that is critical because we're finding a lot of variation depending on how we alter the PSF. And so that is really the game in terms of decomposition. And this code is in Python, it's open source. And so you can, it's easily adaptable to your science needs. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you is we'll have a model PSF for the AGN, plus a single CERSIC for the galaxy at this stage. And you'll see, I'll, I'll elaborate on that a little bit at, at the end. And so the output is the half-light radius and the CERSIC index, descriptive of the shape, um, ellipticity, and as you would expect, positions and fluxes. Okay. <clears throat> So here are three examples of the data in our fitting. So in the left-hand column, you have the HSC images. These are three different quasars from Sloan, redshift less than one. Here is the model, which is the PSF plus the, the single CERSIC. We have to simultaneously model all galaxies in the field of view, because all, when you go to these depths, all the profiles overlap and they affect your, the, your sizes and CERSIC indices. So you've got to do this jointly. Um, and so in the third column here, you can see the, we, we've removed the point source. So you get a clean view of the host galaxy, okay? And then the, you can see the normalized residuals and the surface brightness profiles. Okay. Now, before I go and show you the parameters, the output that you get in terms of these parameters for a sample of 5,000 quasars, you really have to do simulations. And so all the simulations I'm going to show you now are, I think are applicable for LSST, but we should rerun with a, the slightly different pixel size and the different depths. So let me, this looks like a lot, but let me just take you through it. This is now using a, let me see. Okay, this is now using um, the simulated galaxies are model CERSIC, they're smooth CERSIC profiles plus the AGN added, and then these galaxies are put back into HSC images, and then we rerun the decomposition so we can detect, determine whether we can recover the input parameters. And so here is the size, how well we, can we recover size, okay? And this is in bands of magnitude, 18 to 20 for the quasar, 20 to 22, 22 to 23. And sorry. How do I get back? Okay. And at the top here is, these are the, the, the rows are the, the ratio of host flux to total. So at the top here, you're dominated by the host galaxy. Obviously you do really well recovering the sizes. Um, above 20 second magnitude, it gets a little dicey at uh, large sizes. Um, and then you can see that this, so before the raw measurements are where it says before calibration and the mean values are these pink or magenta uh, symbols. So with our, all our simulated galaxies, we've come up with a prescription to correct all of the measurements depending upon neighbors in a five dimensional parameter space to what the actual values are. And so if you look here in the middle, when you have 20 to 50% of the light coming from the host, you see that it, the, the code is not doing well with the size on, for large sizes. However, we are able to recover that, okay, with this, with this calibration. So this is important that there are systematic effects that you have to put in some prescription based upon simulations for size. Magnitude, which you would like to measure at masses, um, is very easy to recover, okay? 
it's not as difficult as the individual parameters. So you see we do really well here across um, magnitude, even down to 23rd magnitude. It starts to get a problem when you're, when you're at one to 20% host flux and your, your, your hosts start to be around 20, you know, hitting the limit, 26 magnitude. So as long as your quasar hosts are brighter than 23rd, and I'll show that most of them are in the real data, and you're, you're, we're doing fine, as long as the galaxy fraction is above 10%. Okay, let me show you Cersic index. This is where things get to be a little bit more difficult, and that you can understand because the Cersic index is very sensitive to any residual emission in the center left over from the, that's not that's degenerate with the quasar or any faint emission on large scales, which could be due to nearby galaxies or just an improper fit. However, this looks pretty good if you look at this. Now this is with smooth galaxies. So you can see that you can recover the, the Cersic index well at bright magnitudes. It starts to become a problem you see really at faint uh, host ratio, flux ratios. Um, it still looks okay, but let me not, you know, get you too excited about this. This is because these are these are model galaxies. Got, galaxies are more complex, so you need we need to use real galaxies as well as the simulated galaxies. So let me just make it clear: we use the simulated galaxies here to correct for these for these offsets, these systematic offsets. But for catastrophic failures, we have to use real galaxies. So these are galaxies, and can we use candles that are we, have, we take their HST measurements as the truth. And then we, for those galaxies, we use their HSC images and add the quasar and then run the decomposition. And that's what you get here in the middle for the Cersic index. So the true Cersic index is on the Y axis and that of HSC is on the X axis. And you can see that there are strong deviations from a one-to-one -one line and we, you know, we somewhat correct for that with the, the smooth model galaxies. However, with the failures at, that are pegged at redshift seven, sorry, redshift, Cersic index of seven, we have to um, reevaluate those. And so what we do is we fix those to n equals two and we rerun so that we can recover the sizes. And that does pretty well. The sizes that we measure from HSC are in pretty good agreement with candles. And so sizes is a more robust parameter that we can feel confident about. All right, look, now I'm gonna go back to the data. About three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, so this is just some of the data. So this is now the host flux as a function of redshift. At low redshift, you're at about 70% host flux. It's decreasing to about 30% due to surface brightness dimming. The quasar is getting brighter. You're looking further into the UV. Um, I'm not going to talk about much of this. There are objects that we don't detect the host, and that's about 3% in the I band, and it gets worse at, at higher redshifts. So let me just show you some of the results. Um, as I said, um, being, uh, sorry, the host magnitudes distributions are shown here for three redshift intervals. Happily, most of them are brighter than 22nd magnitude. So we are able to measure sizes and Cersic indices with no trouble. Cersic indices distribution look like they're, 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 at, they're uh, peaked at low values as we would expect their disk like. Okay, um, I won't say, too, I'll go through this quickly because I want to get to a little science. We get five bands decomposed so we can fit SEDs, we can measure stellar masses. There's a slight offset when you look at candles compared to HSC, so we can calibrate for that offset. You can ask me in the question time about that if you want. All right, science. Um, and these are things that we can do with LSST, of course. Um, where's my mouse? Um, okay, I lost my mouse. This is now the size mass relation between um, of galaxies comparing star forming and quiescent. And so the star forming, let me get my mouse back. Oh. Okay, so the, in each redshift bin, the dark blue line is the mean size mass relation for star forming galaxies. The black line is the, the mean relation for quiescent. In the AGN hosts, why they have a broad distribution, their mean is intermediate between these two. 
So it, it, it seems to make sense of our understanding that the black holes like to be in, you know, reside in galaxies with a central mass concentration. So we're probably seeing that a buildup of that central mass and the single cirrusic is not sufficient. Um, and these galaxies could be going undergoing a, a uh, transition, you know, from a, from a star forming to a, a, a bulge dominated galaxy. However, they have not quenched their star formation. I won't show that, but they're still forming stars at the same rates as the disk galaxies. All right, another thing. Now we have stellar mass. We can look at the black hole to host mass relation. And this is a paper submitted by Jun Yao. And what she is doing here is she's, you see the data as the small points. We only have 500 Sloan quasars out of the 5,000 that we can use for this because you have to con very carefully control for selection. And we can only use the uniform sample. And so this is where LSST can make a huge improvement in number statistics. And what we've done here is we've, we've assumed, we've modeled, we've created a simulated sample, which are the small yellow points, which are the distribution is if the black hole to host mass relation followed the local relation, if you apply all selection effects, you get the blue dots. And the blue dots give you these offsets in black hole mass to stellar mass, exactly matching pretty well the observed data. And so we think that this ratio is consistent with the local relation once you appropriately model all the selection. Okay, last slide. Second to last. Now, what I showed you was, you know, everything based on assuming that the, the hosts were simple, single cirsic. That's not true as we know that. And so we're exploring whether at low redshift we can model further additional components. And this is exploratory, but we can we hope we can find a parameter space where this can work, where you can include a bulge component and maybe even a bar. Okay. And uh, I'll just say. Um, the structure is not smooth in a lot of these quasars. We see spiral structure, as I mentioned in the beginning. So we're trying to understand, well, the connection between spiral structure. This is also where LSST can play a, a large role. You need large number of statistics for feeding machine learning to see if you can see differences in the inner structures, the substructure of quasar host compared to inactive galaxies. And in a small number of cases, you know, one point source is not enough. You need two. There's two quasars there. And so HSC is finding these. They're rare, but they are there. And so LSST will be great for that. Okay. How much time do I have, Gordon? Uh, we're, we're at time, but, you know, feel free right, to quickly. slide and we'll do questions. Yeah, just quickly. I think... By doing this decomposition and removing the AGN, we also help the galaxy scientists. You don't have to throw out those galaxies that have quasars. You can put them back into your sample because they're, they're probably very interesting, especially at the massive end. So all of these simulations that I showed, I think we should do the same with LSST mock images, really testing the accuracy of the PSF and the greater depth plus the availability of the U-band. Once you decompose these images and you have the photometry in the, of the galaxies, we can use those for photometric redshift estimates. And I think we should test to see how accurate that is. And then the last thing is just, we're producing mock HSC images using TNG50. It's easy for us to do that for LSST as well. And that's really, I think, important too, of comparing the, you know, the galaxies to the simulations. Thanks. Great. Uh, thanks, John, especially for the late night uh, presentation. All right, we've, we've got time for a few questions. <coughs> I can ask a question if this is Michael here. Please, Michael. Um, so I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that, um, the PSF modeling error, uh, which is an interesting question. Um, I certainly, I think both with HSC and, and, and with Ruben, we will have I'm hoping we will have an exquisite understanding of our PSF errors because they're very much needed for the weak lensing and folks, there's a lot of infrastructure that has been built there. I, it would be very interesting to know, for example, whether the extent to which, uh, for example, the CIRSIC uh, index uncertainties, which are so large, can be better understood or at least quantified a little bit better um, with proper PSF 
uh, error modeling. Uh, I, I just want to hear your thoughts on on that and related subjects. Yes, it's um, as you know, we've done a lot of testing, Michael, and the but where there's still a lot of more work to be done, and um, we are finding that the the results depend upon the PSF, and so what we're doing is we're you know, for HSC, you can get a model PSF at every position. And so, so what we need to do is we, we're now trying to choose a, a PSF that's slightly offset and use that to model the AGN and then do the decomposition with a, a slightly different PSF. And the numbers do jump around. And so we really need to work on understanding the errors on the PSF and the color dependence on the PSF because the PSFs mm -hmm. are used from stars of different colors than the AGN. Yep, yep, yep. So yeah, a lot of work needs to be done on, on, on that part that we haven't done is the uncertainties on the, uh, on the parameters based upon different PSFs. Great, great. Uh, Amanda? Yep. Uh, thanks. Thanks for a great talk. So I have a, a comment and a question. So um, I completely agree with your last bullet point about the, you know, uh, exploiting um, quasars where, where the quasar is fading. The other population that um, I've been really impressed with the HSC data in terms of studying host galaxies, as I showed, is um, quasars with even a modest level of obscuration, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. where, where the, the, the HSC data that the hosts become visible. Um, just in, in terms of my question, I, maybe I missed this in your talk because you, you showed that you'd done the fitting, I think, across multiple bands. Um, so I wasn't sure if you're, you, if you're simultaneously model fitting across all of, of the bands. And if so, is there a potential to incorporate priors um, about the form of the SED? Because we, we sort of know um, that quasar SEDs behave differently to, to galaxy SEDs. So have you thought about incorporating the form of the SED as a prior um, when you're doing the, the fitting, if, if you are doing the fitting across the entire wavelength range. Um, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we are not right now, but we, we wanna explore that. Right now, the I-band is the best scene. So we, we, do the fitting of, we do the fitting on the I-band first and then we fix that and then we apply it to the other bands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are, there are a lot of issues that, um, you, you know, you mentioned SED the sizes have to all be shifted to a common um, rest frame. So we shift to 5,000 angstrom using prescriptions that are based on the galaxies. And so we also need to make sure we need to, I, we've done some tests and um, which, I, so I think it's okay, but I, it, we, you also have to make sure that you're using the, you're, you're understanding that the stellar population and the host galaxies may be different. And so the shifts in size with wavelengths can, can differ from, the galaxy population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of, I, 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 if people are interested, you should look at the paper. There are a lot of um, decisions that have to be made on whether the, the objects are, you have a good fit um, and what you include in your sample, which is too much for me to, to describe here. Thanks. Okay, one last question from UA Shen before we um, uh, take a break. Yes, uh, thanks, John. It's a great use of HSC data. Uh, so I have a, uh, a quick question on the, uh, uh, the black hole mass host stellar mass relation. Mm. Um, so I understand that you've performed uh, 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 a modeling to correct for selection biases. Uh, but also, I assume that the uh, uncertainties in the stellar mass measurements uh, probably also incorporated in that for the model. And, and I'm curious, uh, by looking at the, uh, the observed relation, which is uh, um, flatter uh, than the local relation, uh, and that's often seen in, uh, in uh, other studies. Uh, and I, I, I'm wondering, uh, is that bias relation mostly caused by selection or caused by the uncertainties in the uh, uh, stellar mass measurements uh, or the black hole mass measurements. Stellar mass measurements. You, you mean the offset to high black hole masses? It's not just an offset, but also it's kind of a tilt of the slope, right? Compared to the it, local. Area. Yeah, it, it's 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 due to it's due to the it's due to a, a, an accumulation of of the uncertainties and the biases. It's not just one or the other. Right, and my question is, which one would play a bigger role in that uh, bias? Uh, 
I think they both, uh, I think they both do on I can't, I, I, similar levels. I can't give you, I have to give you, that's, a, that's, that's good for us to try to exact, to quantify that view, which I don't think we've done, but it's not one or the other. They're both important at similar levels. Okay, thanks. I'm happy to show you, to tell you, provide more information offline um, and show you. The, but the one thing that I can tell you, which is, which I think is going to, a nice, from Jen Yao's modeling of all of the uncertainties and the, and the biases, we've been able to make a, a um, show the dependency of the, the, um, the offset in the relation as a function of the scatter in the relation, and the two are coupled. Right. Right. And the reason I'm asking is that it, it, it tells us uh, which way we should do to improve the results. So we can, if we space it due to selection, then we can go deeper um, in the flux limit. Or if it's due to the uncertainties, then we need a better measurements. So that's, yeah. But yes. Why don't, we, um, why don't we table this for the, yeah. for the discussion session? Um, and so, uh, let me suggest indeed uh, that people um, post things in the chat that they want to discuss in the discussion session. We've got you know 45 minutes at the end of the day for that. Although um, I hope for John's sake he's sleeping by then, um, but we can certainly uh, you know keep the discussion going uh, online too. Um, so we're going to take a break till 12:20 uh, Eastern, so 17 uh, minutes from now, a little bit longer than um, in the current schedule. Uh, Mara Salvato had a withdraw this afternoon, um, so we've got a, a little extra time for, for some breaks. Uh, Mara did give a, a talk uh, to the uh, PhotoZ subgroup um, uh, relatively recently that many of you didn't see, so we'll, we'll post that in the chat, and that, that will be a way for you to uh, learn a little bit more about what Mara has going on. Uh, so Matthew Temple will um, take things over at uh, 1220 Eastern. 16 Gordon, sorry, but I think you still see my screen, correct? Yes. I, I have lost control of my mouse on my keyboard and I can't stop sharing. So can you kick me out? Yeah, okay, we, we'll figure that out. All right. All right, thanks everybody. We'll see you in a little bit. <laughs>